Hey everyone, how you doing? I've got Mark Erickson here with me, and we're going to talk about Replay. Replay is a really cool technology. I first met Jason Laster at ReactConf 2019, and he didn't even do a talk there, but he was showing me this thing called Replay that he was working on, and it was phenomenal. It completely blew my mind, and it completely changed how I think about debugging in the browser. It's not just about here's a console log or here's a debugger statement and then you're going and trying to check into it. It's like having debugger statements that you can put in the past. And so I'm going to let Mark take it over from here because Mark just joined that team and I want to have him explain what Replay is and how it works. Hi, I'm Mark Erickson. If you know me, you probably know me as either the Redux guy or the guy with the Simpsons avatar, but I actually do have a day job where I get to write code for real. A couple months ago, I joined a startup called Replay. And Replay is building a time-traveling debugger for JavaScript applications. I'd actually first met our CEO, Jason Laster, back in like, well, met back in like 2018 because he was working on the Firefox dev tools, which were built with React and Redux. And so we were talking about some of the implementation details. Over the next couple of years, Jason started working uh, on building out this time-traveling debugger functionality, originally as part of Firefox. And I, he and I talked about it a couple of times. So when I started looking for a new position back at the start of the year, I talked to a whole bunch of companies and Replay was one of them. And frankly, Replay was the only one that got me really excited. And what we can talk about some of the reasons why later, but I guess you kind of the big question is like, what is Replay? Why does this matter? As developers, we spend a lot of time debugging software. Like we're not just sitting here writing code. We spend a lot of time reading code and a lot of time trying to figure out why that code is actually broken and like as as developers the like the very first rule of debugging software is you need to be able to reproduce the issue you've got to be able to set it up make the bug happen repeatedly and then you can go in and start to understand well what is the code doing and step through it and that that also sets you up for okay i make a change and then i can go through and verify that that the behavior is fixed and actually is doing now what i expect it to do and the problem is trying to capture those reproductions it can be really hard, you know, especially when you're you're stepping through some code and you go like you're at a break point and you step through and you realize you just step past the one function you should have gone inside or like it's, it's really hard to set up that reproduce in that reproduction environment. And replay is a tool that is designed to help solve those problems. So the basic idea is you start by downloading our special fork of the Firefox browser. We've also got Chrome for Linux at the moment, Chrome for Mac coming later this year, and Node for Linux, I believe, at the moment. But most of the time, you'll be using the Firefox fork at the moment. So you download that special fork of Firefox, open it up, go to your website, and press the record button, go to your website, use the app as normal for a couple minutes, and hit save, and it uploads the recording to the cloud. So from there, you go to our website, open the recording, and what you see inside looks like the Firefox dev tools running as an app in the browser because it actually is the Firefox DevTools as an app running in the browser. And from there, you've got all the usual debugger capabilities, but with some, a whole bunch of added special capabilities on top, like the ability to pause at any point in time in the recording and the ability to add print statements to any line of code and it'll show you how many times that line of code got hit and it'll start printing out what what that line would have printed every time the code ran. This is my and this is my local latest downloaded copy of our version of Firefox and I'm going to go record one of my usual examples here uh which is the standard Redux uh counter app as a code sandbox straight out of the Redux documentation. Um, so this is Firefox with extra stuff running inside. Uh, and in particular, you notice we've got this record button up here. So I'm going to hit record and it'll reload the page and it is now tracking everything that's going on in the browser. So I'm just going to use this app for a minute. So click this a few times, click add them out, click add again, maybe, maybe go down and I'm going to hit stop. And it's going to upload that recording to our cloud and I'm going to save the title to it. And now it's shifting over to the actual application debugging application on our website. So it's uploading the recording and actually usually it's even faster than that. But I, I suspect all the all the zoom streaming and everything that's going on is sucking up a bit of my bandwidth at the moment. Sit here and watch the count and watch the uh, upload counter go up for a bit. So let me, let me actually talk for a minute more about like what, what actually just happened. 
So there are tools that can do various forms of recording within an app. You know, you've got LogRocket, which is which can record user sessions. And then it kind of it actually like captures the DOM behavior specifically. And then when someone's looking at the da- the LogRocket dashboard and replaying a user session, it's basically recreating the DOM that it tracked specifically. Chrome has some kind of like a, a recording capture that can capture user interactions. Replay goes much deeper than that. Replay actually captures all the interactions that happened at the operating system level. So every time the browser opened a socket, every time the browser tried to read or write a file, every time it calls out to like, I don't know, like the C random functions, it is recording every one of those low level operating system interactions. And that's the data that this actually ends up writing to disk. Okay. So we're now looking at the replay debugging application, app.replay.io. And you don't actually have to use our special version of Firefox to look at this. This is now just a normal website. I actually just use this in Chrome most of the time. What we're looking at here to begin with is the viewer mode. And this is a literal video playback of what I was just doing in the application a minute ago. So if I hit the play button back here, we should actually see my cursor moving around. We can see the indication that I clicked a few times, clicked again, and then you can see my cursor starting to move up and away towards the the stop button back there. Over here on the left, we have a bit of a timeline representing some of the events, like when I actually had a click or a keystroke. Down here, we've got a bunch of loading information that says both where are we stopped in the overall recording, and also like how much of it is loaded right now, how much of the back end has actually processed this data. And this is all well and good, but what's actually interesting is the code. So if I press this DevTools tab over here, now this switches over into what is really your standard debugger tool, uh, just like in the Firefox or Chrome DevTools. All right, so we had Viewer, which is going to see the playback, and then we have DevTools, which is now what you would be used to in the browser. Yep. And so we've still got a miniature version of the viewer over here, but now we've got, for example, the source code tree. And this is showing all like all the JavaScript files that were in the browser at the time they uploaded. So in this case, like it was a code sandbox app running as the standalone mode rather than the in sandbox editor. And so looking at the list of files, I can see, you know, there were some source files from codesandbox.io. There was some webpack stuff in here. There was the actual source code from the literal application that's in the sandbox. Oh, and it has the source maps included. Oh yeah. Oh, yes. We we love source maps. And so I can click on index.js and I can see, you know, here is the actual index file from the app that we were just playing with. If I look at, you know, features, counter, counter slice, this is the actual Redux code that was just being used in the example app. And I can turn off source maps and see what the, you know, the somewhat uglier code looks like, uh, especially because I think it had all the the code sandbox wrappers. So over here on the left side, you got a few different things. Uh, the left-hand panel can show um, like these click events and some basic metadata. Uh, we've got the ability to add comments, and I'll show that more in a minute. We've got the source explorer, which shows us the, the file tree of the JavaScript code, as well as showing you the outlines of all the different functions in the application. You've got source, which or, or the, the search capability, which can show you full text search. If I were to start searching for counter slice, that should you know, identify that, hey, look, there's like it found the literal term counter slice in that file. And then, and then the last thing that we have over here is the pause information. And if you're paused, this is where it shows you the current call stack, the variables in scope, any breakpoints you have, and the print statements. So let's let's actually start talking about that a little bit. So we know that I clicked the increment button a few times and I clicked the add amount button a couple times. So we're looking at this counter slice file right now. And this is this is the Redux logic. I'm going to start hovering over some of the, the line numbers here. And it's going to tell me that this line in the increment case reducer got hit four times over the course of the recording. And you know th- this line ran once, and this line did not run at all, and this line ran once. 
okay, well, maybe I want to know more about what was going on during one of the times that this line of code got hit. Yeah, so if I if I was doing this in a standard browser, I would have opened up the app. I would have had to open up the source files first to f and found the files that I cared about. I would have had to add a breakpoint at this line ahead of time before I started clicking on any on any of the buttons. And then the first time I would click the button, it would break here and then I could step through. So I'm, I'm back here in, in Firefox and I've got the sandbox app open and I'm going to open up counterslice.js out of here. And I'm gonna have to add a breakpoint here ahead of time. And now I'm going to click the plus button and it immediately pauses there. And then I've got my, my step options. And in this case, stepping isn't gonna do much because it's a one line function. But if I were to step further, it would take me down into the guts of Redux Toolkit. And if I wanted to know like what happened at like the third or fourth or 50th time this got hit, I would possibly have to keep clicking the plus button, coming over here, clicking continue, clicking the plus button in the app, coming over here, clicking continue, and repeat, repeat, repeat until I got to the point that I actually cared about. Well, in replay, I can add a breakpoint or a print statement here once. And when I click this plus sign, a couple things happened. Number one is we have our little tooltip like thing. And this is doing a few different bits. The first thing you'll notice is that we've got some information here, and this is the name of the function and the line number by default. It's just pre-populating it with some basic information. The second thing you'll notice is that over here in this console logging area, we now have four different lines, and they all say the exact same thing, increment 14, because that's what this message is telling it to print. Well. I'm probably more interested in like what was state.value at the time the function started run. So I could come in here and I can maybe like replace the line number with state.value and it's going to reevaluate what this would have printed every time that line of code ran. So the very first time we came into this function was when I clicked the plus button for the first time. So at that time, the, the state value was zero. Okay, so I'm going to remove the breakpoint or the print statement. I hover over here. I see that the line was hit four times over the course of the recording, hit the plus sign, and it defaults to name of function line number. And so I click in here to edit this, and I'm just going to say state.value because that's that's what I want to print out. And I hit enter, and it prints. And you can even do other fun stuff like maybe maybe I only wanted this to log like if the value was odd. So I can expand the filtering options and add a condition here. And I can say state.value uh, mod two equals one. Trying to do my math here. And now it's only going to print the time when it was one and the time when it was five. Yeah, these uh, these conditionals are available in the Chrome DevTools too. But the difference or the Firefox DevTools, the difference here is that the GUI is a lot nicer for replay, but also you're doing it over time. You're not just doing it when it happens. You're doing it literally over the extent of the entire time that the recording happened. Yeah. So with with normal debugging, I would either have had to have added a true a real console log statement in my code before I opened the app and then it would print every single time. Or I would have had to add a breakpoint in the developer tools and made it conditional and like modified the logging output. Uh, and then I would still have to do that like that, like some of that pause, resume, pause, resume. And here's just like, oh, here's a line of code, print me some stuff. And for that matter, like we can see that this line of code got hit once and maybe maybe I want to know like where in the sequence of events did this particular reducer get hit and so I can add you know something similar over here and so now I can see that you know that line where it ran one two three times then the increment by amount and then the increment again uh, we also so you're logging each reducer right now, except for the decrement. Yeah, actually, oh yeah, decrement did run once. And notice that the decrement went right at the bottom of those increments because in the in time when this occurred, he went increment, 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 increment by amount, which added two, mm -hmm. and then increment, and then did the decrement right after. So these are all in chronological order in the yep. in the console log here. Uh, so maybe maybe I've got a bunch of print statements like this, and I kind of want to differentiate which ones which. Like in this case, they're all printing out, you know, something and a value. And maybe I want to make one of these stand out 
So we actually just recently added the ability to have a little extra highlight next to some of these. Oh, that's cool. So you can color code them or put an emoji, in this case, the unicorn. Yep. Wow, yep. that's cool. So, so that also helps identify which one it is without having to look at the word like increment or increment by amount. You could just visually scroll through it and see where they're all located. Yep. Yeah, j j just a little visual distinguisher. Now, there's a few other things on the screen here that I'm, I'm looking at, and you're probably going to get into them in a second, but there are dots on this blue bar. And then there's also yes. the print statements yes. that you've left hidden on the left side. Yeah. Um, so the print statements is just telling me that like in this file, I've added three of these print statements and what, here's the message. Here's, here's the line. Uh, and I can, I can, you know, click to remove those if I want to. Um, so just kind of an at a glance view of all the print statements that you've added across all the files. Okay. So when it comes to debugging, there's two basic tools that we use as we're trying to understand the flow of execution. And the first one is console logging, printf debugging, whatever you want to call it, depending on your background. And that's what we're doing here. We've added print statements to certain lines of code. Those are printing out as the lines get hit. It's useful information. This is telling us what order these things happened in. The other tool that we normally use is a step debugger where you can pause in the code. You can inspect the variables at that point in time, and you can say, go to the next line, go to the next line, go into this function, go out of this function. So how do we start doing that here? Well, there's actually a couple different ways that we can start jumping in and pausing inside of this code actually from these print statements. That's a great thing. Like with replay, you're, you don't choose one or the other. You can use both of these capabilities and springboard back and forth. So here we can see looking at this little timeline right here, four blue dots. And yes, that corresponds exactly to the four times that this line of code ran. Yeah, so what's interesting here is that they're also all the same length so that you can see where the dots lie between all of those segments that we're logging in the code. Yeah, so actually even just looking at this visually, I can see that we had three hits here in increment, then one for increment by amount, then increment, and then decrement. So I'm going to click on the second dot here in the increment area. And now we are paused on this line of code as it's about to execute, just like any other debugger is in action. To explain what just happened here, because this is probably blowing people's minds and they're probably a little confused. You've clicked on a dot, which means at the time when this recording took place, when the second increment was clicked and that reducer was run, that is now where we're at in the code. We've stepped to that line. And if you look down in the console log, you'll also see a red line there. That is also where the where the console is. So the console hasn't logged one, two, three, or anything else yet. Technically, it's only logged the zero. But because we have the whole recording, we know what's coming next, but we also know where we're currently located. Uh-huh, yeah. And yeah, so we, it's, it's showing that red line to say, like, you are here paused in this timeline at the moment. Uh, and we can also see a corresponding dot here with the with the complete timeline. So this this just represents the log output. This represents the literal like number of seconds of the recording. And so we can see that we're paused at you know somewhere in five seconds in the recording. Now I can use all your standard step debugging tools. So over here. I can see this is the current JavaScript call stack at this point in time. And we can see that I'm inside a function called increment in counter slice, which is being called by actually a reducer function that is part of Redux Toolkit, which is also being called by the Emmer library and then more Redux, more Redux, more Redux, all the way back out to the click handler in my React component. This call stack is really clean. And not only that, you didn't say anything about it, but when you hovered over Reducer, it didn't just say Redux, it has the logo in there. What the heck? Uh, so that's actually something that's specific to the Firefox dev tools that we got for free when we copy pasted that code. Uh, Firefox's dev tools specifically inspects file paths and it looks for certain known framework names. And so if it sees those, it could say, oh, oh, this this whole series of stack frames is from React or Redux or Angular or Vue. And it can both collapse them and also like start to show like a little icon. Like, because most of the time, like you don't care about the guts of React as your are But it's helpful to know that the like these eight stack frames were were from React. This part right here isn't actually all that special. Like literally Firefox itself will do that part today. But like 
this is a normal debugger. I can go backwards in the call stack and look at another function. And in that function, I can see, you know, what the variables were that were in scope at that time. But what does get interesting is we know this line of code got hit four times. What if I just want to skip straight ahead to the next time this line of code ran? I can click the jump forward button and boom, we are now here and here and here. And we've, we've skipped ahead to the next time that I clicked the plus sign and we ended up down in this reducer. And I can skip ahead to here. And now I'm at the, the fourth and last time this line of code ran. And this is also represented in the timeline at the bottom. So right now it looks clean. But once you hover over one of these, it shows that and represents those dots in the timeline at the bottom. So I think you just hovered over the increment by amount. And you can see where this lies relative to the increment by amounts as well. So this is where this starts to become really powerful because you have, on the one hand, you have the ability to add these print statements after the fact, something that you cannot do in normal debugging. And you can see all the printing, all the timelines. You can add the little unicorn console highlights. And from there, oh yeah. So I'm hovering over the console messages here. And right now we're paused basically at the last time that we printed increment. So it's actually the exact same functionality. Like I want, like I can jump to a point in time by clicking one of the dots here on the breakpoint callouts. But I can also jump to that exact same point in time by hovering over one of the log messages and jumping back to the exact same point in time. And now I can expect inspect this and see, you know, okay, the value was one, and then we added something to it in the reducer. So you've got the best of both worlds. You've got the ability to do your console logging after the fact, and you've got the ability to do all the step debugging, step in, step out, step over, look at all the values that are inside there, but, and you have the ability to jump back and forth in time and start to see what's going on. Now, beyond that, replay is a great tool for collaboration. And part of the, you know, the process of debugging is you start to have these insights of, oh, I was expecting the app to do this thing here. And it act like it, it, it took the else instead of the if or something, or, oh, wait a minute, the value was this at this point in time, that that seems important. And like, you want to remember these things for yourself for later, but you also want someone else who can look at this replay to start to have that same context that you have as you're debugging this, this code. And so replay lets you add comments basically anywhere. So for example, Right now, I'm paused at the second time this line of code got hit. So I'm going to add a comment and says the value is one and we're about to add to it. So if I had this recording open, am I going to see that comment in real time? I believe so. Yeah, uh, I, I'm, that's going to blow my mind. This is this is this is way beyond where it was three years ago. Yep. There's oh, nothing it, like it's, this. it's come. It's come a long way in the last six months. It's come a long way in the last two months just since I joined. Um, so all these comments are persistent. So. I could share this replay with someone else and they could open it up and they would immediately see the comment that I've left here. And all the console logs, right? Yeah. So I'm going to jump ahead in time for a second to towards the end of the recording. This comment is associated with both a line of code and the point in time where that pause was. So you notice right now I'm paused right at the decrement. I'm going to click right here and it's going to jump me back to the file, to that line of code, to that point in time. And so if like, if you're tracing execution flow through a dozen different files, you can start to leave these notes describing, here's what I found, here's when this value changed, wait, this doesn't look great, it seems suspicious. You can share the replay to somebody else, they can open up and they can see exactly what you were describing. They can jump to any, every one of these comments, look at the code and the data at that point in time. And in fact, you can use this for other purposes. There's a feature I've been working on, which we'll talk about later, where I needed to add some modifications to our preferences behavior. Yeah, something else when I first saw Replay, I was thinking about is not just my local development machine, which is I'm not always going to be recording, right? I'm usually going to do that only when I've got a bug or like a Heisen bug or something. But one of the things that I think about when I see replay is give it to your QA team and make them do that exactly while they're working. This is like the only thing they use. They're always recording. They're always setting these up. And then 
if anything bad happens, now they just send you the replay and you can look at it as a developer and actually see the debug tools and that you don't have to ask them, you don't have to screen share, you don't have to do anything weird like that. Exactly that. Um, and, and literally, like I've, I've sat in on a, on a couple calls with, with customers or would-be customers and QA team feeding bug reports to the dev team is by far one of the biggest points of interest. Now, I'm going to caveat this a minute, a bit by contrasting what replay does right now versus what we want to be able to do by the end of the year. So right now, you've got to download our special version of Firefox or Chrome. You have to open the website, hit the record button, which reloads the page, use the app for a couple minutes and hit save, and then it uploads just what it saw while you were doing the recording. That's good, but there is friction. Like you've like maybe you were using your normal Chrome or Firefox and then you saw the bug and now you got to sw switch to the special replay browser and then you have to hit the record button. Maybe maybe you can't reproduce the bug exactly because you browsers and stuff like that. So like it's good, but there's some friction there. What we want to do by the end of the year is have both Firefox and Chrome optimized enough for recording that you can open up Again, our special fork of them, but you could basically use that as your permanent development or testing browser, and it would be permanently recording the entire time you have it open without needing to hit the record button first. And then if you see the bug, you don't have to stop and hit record and redo the process. You just hit the save button and it's already got like the last five or 10 minutes sitting in a buffer and it just uploads that. That's what we want to get to because that takes 90% of the friction out of the process. Like you don't even have to reproduce the bug. The bug happened. We recorded it. Now you just upload it. This is what I would like to out of a browser is it just has this built in. And one of the things we want to make clear is that it's not recording like video. So you're not recording gigabytes and gigabytes of video. It's very small kilobytes and maybe even megabytes of binary data. 15 to 20 megs would be common. But like I so said, it's, it's all that data about like the browser opened a socket. The browser received, you know, 5,000 bytes of data over the socket. The browser did a paint operation, stuff like that. Something else I noticed when you were going and doing the debugging, it's kind of funny that we're using Redux here and basic Redux because this is Dan's original vision for time travel yes. debugging. And now it actually works and we can use the browser and it doesn't necessarily depend on the original implementation of Redux. That's, that's one of the great things too. So what I'm showing you here, because it records at the operating system level where the browser is talking to the operating system, it does not know or care what framework you've used to build your app. React, Vue, Angular, Ember, Backbone, vanilla JavaScript, Svelte, whatever, I don't care. If you can load a website in a browser and run code, it can be recorded in replay. Caveat, I'm not sure how well we handle Wasm right now. I don't think we handle WebGL at the moment. But okay, so the caveats are if it's JavaScript and it operates on the DOM, we can handle recording it. Which is the typical use case that you would see this used. I mean, most yeah. people debugging WebGL are going to be using a totally different tool set in the first place. Although if we can manage to pull off recording WebGL down the road, there's some really sweet use cases for that. But so having said that, this is a totally framework agnostic tool. Like that literally Jason has sent me replays. I think at one point he recorded StubHub.com that had a bug in their checkout flow and he sent it to me and I was looking through it. It's like, oh, look, it's backbone code. I love <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we do have some special integration with React at the moment. So over here, let's, let's, let's actually explore over here for a minute. So over here, we've got, we got a few different tabs and these are basically the tabs you would see in the browser's development tools. So we've got the elements panel and this is going to show you, you know, all the actual, you know, all the actual elements that were in the DOM at the time that the app was loaded and was running. And more specifically, at the time that I'm paused right here. Now, in this case, it's kind of wonky because this was all running inside of a, oh, there we go, inside of a code box. But like, yeah, I can see that like at this point in time, there was, there was a div. And if we were to drill down inside of the div enough, we would see that at that point in time, the, the div had a span and the span had a text of one. Like literally that is what the DOM was right there. And oh, by the way, this is actually like live DOM technically running inside of oh, Replay. Can you can you modify like, it? You, you couldn't. So last time I saw it, you couldn't do that because of the way the technology is working. Because that yeah. would create a different timeline, essentially. Right, right. So it's it's read only. But the point is, like, I can come in here and I can click on this button, and I I can see all the style rules that applied to the button. 
and I can look at all the, the layout boxes and, and everything else. So the, but the other thing you might want to know here is, well, what were, what were my React components that were generating all this DOM in the first place? And so we do actually specifically have integration with the React dev tools. And obviously this is a really, really simple app, but look, here's my provider and here's my app and here's my counter component. And ooh, that exploded. That's not cool. That's not supposed to happen. Uh, pretend he didn't see that. I love these live feeds. He can just not show that one. <laughs> here's um, a counter component. So, oops. <laughs> yep. That was, that was supposed to have actually shown the real props and hooks and everything coming out of that component. I don't have an answer for why it didn't. It's software. Like our software is not perfect. There's also a network tab over here. And in this case, uh, the actual app didn't have any network requests, but code sandbox did. And so look, like we, we made requests for JavaScript and Babel and a whole bunch of other transpiler stuff. Like, like these are the actual requests that that sandbox serve app made as the page was loading. And oh, hey, look, I can I can rewind to those points in to time. Right before it got loaded. And I can look at the responses and everything else. And I actually have not played around with this very much myself. If it made network requests, you can, you can inspect those. Can you go to the Redux tab? I'm a little curious about that one. Yes. So this is what I've been working on within the last couple of weeks. So the React integration was added several months ago, and I obviously am an expert on Redux. Hi, reminder, I maintain Redux. I've, I've created Redux Toolkit. I've written half of our docs, most of our, almost all of our tutorials. I built the last two version, major versions of React Redux basically by myself. Yeah, I do Redux stuff. Hi. As you were pointing out earlier, like the original selling point, the original demo that Dan did for Redux was indeed time travel debugging, specifically for global application state. We want to know what events occurred in the app, you know, to do added, counter incremented, whatever. We want to see descriptions of those like increment plus one or to do added by milk. We want to see what state changed as a result of that. And we want to see the final state after that finished. So one of the great things about Redux is it's got the browser extension dev tools. And I actually don't think I have them loaded into the Firefox fork, but let me go over here to Chrome for a second. If I'm in here in my standard browser development tools and I have the Redux dev tools extension configured in the application and added to my browser, and I start clicking around here and I come back here, you've got your dev tools. I can see, okay, here was the initial state in the application. I can see that the action that I dispatched an increment action, the state changed. Here's the final state as a result. And we can see the history of our state and the user interactions with the application over time. And this is a great tool. And this is really one of the biggest reasons why Redux is still a very valuable tool today. So wouldn't it be great if we had a way to integrate that into Replay itself? Like if you were using a Redux application and you recorded it, wouldn't it be great to see the history of the Redux actions like inside of Replay's UI? And now this time when you go back to an action that was that had an async thunk or something associated with it, it's not going to just keep playing those through as you do it. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so over the last few weeks, please don't crash, please don't crash. I have successfully implemented a very, very initial proof of concept integration, not production ready yet, of the Redux dev tools into Replay's UI. And in fact, there's actually two different pieces that happen here for both React and Redux. First, we actually have to run a bunch of the actual extension code inside our fork of Firefox while we're doing the recording in your local computer and doing the replaying part in the cloud. So your app, as it's running, thinks it's talking to the React extension or the Redux extension, and it feeds over all the same data. Like React is saying, here, it's rendered, here's the components that changed. Redux is saying, here's an action, here's the contents. Well, we kind of hijack that and save that data as sidebar metadata annotations for later use. When you open up the recording, the client requests all those annotations from the back end. We render the UI of those extensions as components in our app, and then we kind of carefully insert the data so it can start to be displayed. So if I click ahead to a point in time in the timeline, oh, look, there's a bunch of Redux actions. 
And this is literally the exact same DevTools component that we just saw in a browser as an extension a minute ago. Here's the status on this right now. I literally spent one week to throw this together. Uh, I actually had to burn a week first to set up a local development environment for a back end so I could build a browser. One week to get this integrated to our Firefox fork and then figure out how to render the components, the UI, and shove the Redux actions in there. It's here. It's live in production right now. It is behind a feature flag that you have to actually turn on first in order to even see that tab show up. And this assumes that you've actually recorded any Redux data to begin with. The caveat here is, number one, there are some crash bugs. I've actually seen a, almost like an infinite crash bug happen with this myself. I actually need to try and take a look at some of that tomorrow. The second thing is, this is not what we want to ship as kind of like the V1 production release. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one is that the Redux DevTools components, they just don't quite match the, the look and feel of the rest of our application. Number two is that there's a bunch of options in here which actually don't make sense when we're showing this inside of Replay. Like I can't actually jump to this or skip an action, everything's happened. I can't just like pretend that the action didn't get dispatched. I actually tried to turn off some of these buttons and, and the set and the, the code settings in the logic for the extension didn't do what I thought they would do. So like it's, it's here, but it, it doesn't do anything. The other thing is though, we want to have tighter integration between looking at like the list of actions and the rest of the replay UI. So like over here, we've got, we've got the little red line that shows you like you are here in the timeline. Like replay is all about timelines or you know the the rewind button that jumps back and pauses the code so that you can start stepping through. Well, this this is a timeline like we we should have the same little red line and we should have like the little rewind button and everything here. Yeah, and you want to make sure that when you click it, it's not going to the dev tools code. It's going to the actual code that caused this to happen in the first place. Right. So what we're so like this is this is v0.5. It's here, it works. You can play around with this right now. But what I'm going to do, hopefully here in another week or two, is I'm going to start working on implementing kind of the, the real productionized version of this, where we're going, I'm going to take existing components like our network tab or some variation on that. I'm going to take some of the guts of the logic from the extension that can manage calculating the, the derived state after each action. But then I'm going to use like our own list view to display the list of actions. And we're going to use like some of our own components to show like the expandable JSON tree and the, the stack traces and stuff like that. So it oh, is part of the console log. Well, well no, it'll, it'll, it'll be a Redux tab. It'll have like the actions list and like a action state diff things here, but we're going to replace the original DevTools UI components with our own equivalents so that we can tighter integrate into the rest of Replay. I see. I see. And that'll be nice. I'm assuming the goal here is that you're going to start doing this with other frameworks in the future as well. Exactly. Exactly. So. React and Redux are obvious starting points because they're they're extremely popular. And also I happen to be like Brian Vaughn, who's now part of the was on React Core and is now with Replay, did some of the assistance. Didn't he work on the React Dev Tools? Yeah. Yeah. He like he has owned the React Dev Tools for like the last four or five years. Oh, okay. So him working on this and also you working on this will be a huge boon to getting yes. these two most used ones off the ground. Well, well, the the React the React ones in here already. Like that's that's there. That's productionized. That's been there for a while. The the Redux one is new that I just added within the last couple of weeks. So long term, yes, we would love to integrate basically any other framework that has like their own custom developer tools. So do you? Svelte, Angular, Ember, like X State, you name it. So actually, here's here's another thing. Something that most people don't know about the Redux dev tools is that they're actually not Redux specific. The guy who wrote most of the Redux extension code wrote it in such a way that it exposes a global method that the app is supposed to talk to. But other libraries that are not Redux can also talk to that app or can also talk to that extension and present their data in the same way. Okay, so let's let's you know what let's let's just record a new one. So this this is another code sandbox that uses the Jotai library uh, created by Daishi Kato, uh, published as part of the Poimandre's GitHub organization. Jotai is a atom based state management framework. So I'm just going to go hit the record button. And this one's really simple. I'm just going to hit increment three times. And we're going to hit save. 
and we'll upload that and hopefully there's not this is doing that weird thing where it doesn't show the loading bar yeah that's that seems very suspicious it's not supposed to be okay there we go okay so yeah uh, it looks like there was about 30 megs of data just from those few seconds okay so i've got my jotai app and we got the dev tools wait why is it showing the redux tab for a jotai app what okay, did you do here? this fingers crossed fingers crossed you know what no I did here's the thing I did nothing special to make this work. And that's because Jotai already knows how to talk to the Redux dev tools. Did, did Daishi like I, do this? Yeah. So like if I come over here and I open up that same sandbox in Chrome, like the Redux dev tools are not Redux specific. And so any library can talk to them if it can format its data in an appropriate way. So NGRX, Zustan, Jotai, and a whole bunch of other libraries can actually show their data in the Redux dev tools already. Like that's that's just part of the ecosystem. So because I set up the Redux dev tools in our browser and we capture data literally the exact same way, it's the exact same extension code running in the browser, this just worked for free. Dude. That's going to be so good. Yeah. And then this also encourages other frameworks to potentially even use the same API if they can, because they'll immediately have integration with replay. To be clear, so there's there's a couple different things. Like if your state management library knows how to talk to the Redux dev tools, this just works. If you have a different framework with your own dev tools, like Vue has their own totally separate dev tools. Angular has their own totally se separate extension. We want to integrate those into replay the same way down the road. That takes work. There's no secret sauce. There's work to do to load code into our browser as the app is running in the cloud. There's a bit of work that has to be done to capture data and place it off to the side. There has to be work done to say, okay, like if the Redux feature is enabled, show the tab. And if the Redux feature is enabled and we have captured Redux data, then show the tab, then pull it in, you know, and then so on and so on. Like it's, it's not magic, it's development work, but we totally can and we want to integrate with any other framework out there that has their own special developer tools because those are useful as you're debugging and we want Replay to be the best tool for debugging. Yeah, and then this also harks into the future prospects of just being able to have that be your browser. And so it's already there. It's already got everything you need integrated into it and it's ready to go. And you don't have to run a separate version of Chrome just for development. Now, like, this is your version of Chrome. Yeah, we, we want to get to the point where you're basically running the Replay Chrome or the Replay Firefox as your daily dev driving browser. So we have, like, the ability to do full text search for files. So when you make recordings, those get uploaded to your library. And by default, they're they're private. Like, I'm the only person who has access to these two these two recordings right now. But a lot of times you want to share them. So I can come in here and I can say, let's... Real quick, do I have to have the replay browser to be able to see this? No. Uh, so you have to have the replay browser to make the recording. Once it's up on the website, you can go to the website in any browser. So I'm, I'm just going to come over here in, in Chrome. Something I want to show is me writing a comment and seeing that show up there as another piece. Sure. Um, let's see. You... Uh, do you have and do you have an account with us at the moment? No, I'm signing in now. This is I was way pre-account when I started looking at it. I have a very bad feeling about. Well, no, I, I was making changes to a file related to the sharing dialogue earlier today, but I haven't merged that PR yet. So if this is broken, that's not my fault yet. Uh, there, there, there's supposed to be a drop down here that says, uh, like, make this public. Mm, I see. I see. If I come in here, okay, interesting. All right. So anyone there, with the link? Okay, so yeah, link? send me that, and I'll. See what I can do. Uh, let's see. So at the moment, we're looking at the Jotai sandbox. I don't even know what the source code. Okay, there's only two files. Look, here's an atom, and here's some derived state. Apparently, I see it. Okay, let me go ahead and share this so we can see it here. Or if you were to like hit reply or leave a comment yourself. Yeah, let me uh, let me I, leave I would, a comment I would, here. I ought to see that pop up within a few seconds, hopefully. And then I can remove mine and you can see yours. Yep. Oh, look. Hi, Kevin. Um, <laughs> and yep, this matters to you. That's wonderful. <laughs> you got an email about it, too. So you can even click in the DOM and put comments and then you can see them represented 
in the timeline and as part of the DOM. That's really interesting. Like, so you can use this for, you know, visual inspection too. Like if you, if you see something on the page as the app was going along, that looks weird, you, you can leave a comment there. Oh yeah. So I, uh, something I think I was saying earlier, and I don't think I had a chance to finish when I was adding the Redux dev tools integration, I needed to figure out how do I add a new entry into our experimental settings dialog? And the problem is because like, because this is our code base is 80% the original Firefox developer tools. We have a lot of legacy code that dates back to like really old Firefox stuff. And that includes the preferences logic. It's ugly to say the least. And so like, I actually was boarding a flight to go to a conference in San Francisco a couple weeks ago. And Jason wanted to let me know what files I would need to touch to add this one lousy little checkbox. So he made a recording of replay itself, which we do on a daily basis, opened up the source code and started leaving comments on the files that relate to the preferences logic and said, add an entry to this array, add, like add an if statement here, add a new pref definition here. And that gave me the breadcrumbs I needed to on that flight, open up this laptop, open up the recording, look at the comments, look at the files, and then in VS Code, start going to those files and actually editing everything. And I added the experimental settings pref on the flight because Jason left me the comments in a replay telling me what to edit. So overall, replay provides a bunch of useful functions as you're trying to debug. It lets you add the print statements after the fact, so you can see you know, what the variables were, what the execution flow lets you add breakpoints. It lets you jump to different points of time. It lets you step through the code. You can leave notes for yourself about the things that you're finding in the form of comments. You can collaborate with other people by sharing the replays and sharing comments and letting them see what's going on. So it's a great tool for you being able to understand what the code is actually doing, but it's also a great tool for being able to collaborate with other people on your team and see what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a big piece of it is the collaboration aspect and how you can not only use it for developers to collaborate with each other, which is a huge important piece because that's usually you have to be over someone's shoulder and now we got a screen share over Zoom or Google Meet or something else, but also so you can interact with other team members at where you're working at, like QA or business people who might be looking at the website and run into an issue on the staging environment. And they need to send you something because they got some demo the next day and they got to show it off and you can't show that feature off if it's broken. So now if you can get the recording off of that, then you can just say, okay, this is what he was doing. This is how I fix it. Now I've used things like full story and log rocket to do this in the past, but I really like how replay works because it's at the browser level or at, I should say at the OS level that it's recording all these things so that you have the actual actual captures of them and you're not looking through a almost like video representation of a DOM with special tooling in place. You're actually using the browser and it includes that time travel debugging, which is what you're currently lacking out of these other tools. Yeah, there's so many things you can do to debug better with replay right now now and there's a whole lot of stuff we haven't even e begun to unlock with the capabilities that the back end has oh <laughs> oh you're making me really interested in hearing a little bit more and something else i noticed in replay that also helps with collaboration is that if you look at the timeline down at the bottom you can see the comments that are made yes. in the timeline live as they get added yeah we, uh, we we've noticed that we keep adding more and more forms of a timeline in here like like the, like there's like there's even another one like like this this apparently lets you just like start to scrub through like like from the time that I clicked in the UI like all the code that executed in that event loop tick oh my god um there's there's the console output there's the you know the kind of like the video timeline we we actually have entirely too many timelines here and at some point we need to start figuring out how to consolidate these so yeah it's it's amazing this is phenomenal so this is what i was looking at when i first saw it in 2019 although it didn't look anything like this it was pretty mm -hmm. much just the console log and a debugger and that was it and now it's like this fully fledged tool it's got way more going on and it works with so many more tools than it used to because the app i saw originally was like a backbone app i wasn't seeing anything special there but it was special because it was special enough for, from my perspective when i went to react conf there were so many talks about really cool things but my takeaway from the entire conference was replay this thing completely blew my mind i couldn't believe what i was seeing and it actually helped me debug some things at work right after it came out and they got the build working i loaded it up on my work Mac and started figuring out, okay, I have this issue. Let me figure out what's going on. And I used replay and I found it really quick. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So something we haven't talked about yet is the pricing model and how there is a company behind an open source product. So Replay is an actual company. Uh, we have employees. We would like to actually make money and survive and continue to build cool things. And that means we, we do actually need to get people to pay for this. One, honestly, one of the things that I may be happy to join Replay is there is a very simple, obvious way that this company will make money. And it's by having people pay us money for a product that's, that saves them time and they keep paying us to use it because it saves them time. But the great thing about the pricing model is it's very simple. It's very obvious. There's no ads. There's no exploitation. Like I, as a person, feel good being part of a company that is very simply charging money for a product. Like this is how it's supposed to work. And I don't have to feel guilty about like, oh no, like we're showing ads and stuff like that. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't want ads in a product like this. Just using Chrome, doing your work and then it started popping up like crazy. So honestly, that that was one of the things that got me excited about joining Replay is it's a simple pricing model and it's very obvious how this company will make money. We build a great tool that saves developers time and they will want to pay us to use that tool. I'd like to give a big thanks to Mark Erickson who spent the time to talk to me about Replay and show me how it works today. If you want to see more videos like this, I've got two more videos with Mark where we go into the source code of Replay where we talk about how to integrate with the API and then we're going to take a look at the source code. And if you want to keep up to date with these videos, please like and subscribe. I would very much appreciate it. I also appreciate the feedback everybody leaves in the comment section so I can improve what I'm doing and do a better job in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.